So now we'll wrap up this lecture by discussing uh, genetic epistasis and how you detect it. So up until now, the type of models that we've discussed for doing association studies are what you would call additive models. And what I mean by additive models, I mean that by fitting straight lines to the scatter plots, what we've effectively assumed is that the effect of adding a single reference allele copy is independent of the number of reference allele copies we had in to begin with. So the effect of going from one to two copies of the reference allele is the same as the effect of going from zero to one. And so there is a large amount of work in the genetics field, which basically shows that uh, there can be a lot more different types of interactions besides these kind of like additive interactions. So for example, epistasis is pretty common as well. And so the idea of epistasis is that the effect of an allele in one locus depends on the effect of an allele found at a different locus. And so you can kind of imagine how this might happen in different circumstances. So imagine, for example, that you're looking at variants inside an enhancer and you have two different loci corresponding to uh, variants found in the binding site of, a, of the same TF. And so you can imagine that uh, whether or not, uh, if, if a TF needs to bind to at least one location in the enhancer in order for the enhancer to operate, then if the binding, if uh, the TF already has a valid binding site in one locus in the enhancer, then it doesn't really matter if there's uh, a second binding site of the same TF somewhere else in the enhancer. But if locus one already has no valid binding site in there because of a variant, then there has to be a valid binding site in the other locus in order for the TF to bind somewhere in this enhancer. And so to make a somewhat more concrete example, suppose that we're studying interactions between two loci uh, within the haploid genome, right? And so there's only one variant found at each locus in this genome. And so further suppose that at locus one, across the population, you see uh, either alleles A or G, and at locus two, you see either the alleles C or T. And so my notation on the x-axis of this plot is that the allele at locus one is on the left of the slash, and the allele at locus two is on the right of the slash. And so basically by comparing different genotypes or different columns in this plot, you can get a sense of what the effect of variant in locus one is conditioned on what the variant at locus two is. So if you compare columns one and three, for example, or the columns that are drawn with a black arrow between them, you can see that at columns one and three, there's a C and locus two in both of these cases. And so the effect of locus two individually is, is the same. And when there's a C at locus two, you can basically see that it doesn't matter whether you have an A or a G in locus one, the phenotype is still the same. And so locus one has no effect when there's a C at locus two. On the other hand, if you look at columns two and four, which are being compared by the red arrow, then when there's a T in locus two, then an A at locus one leads to low BMI and a G at locus one leads to high BMI. And so basically what this means is that when there's a T in locus two, then there is, an, there is a difference between having an A or a G at locus one. And so this is a super basic example of epistasis because it just shows that um, when there's a T at locus two, there's an effect at locus one. Otherwise, if there's a C at locus two, then there's no effect of locus one. And so in this lecture, we didn't really have the time to tie what we were talking about here a lot back to genomics. But what I want to say about tying back to genomics and the theme of this course is that GWAS studies on their own do not give a mechanistic insight. They will give you a list of SNPs that give you regions of the genome where within each region, you know that there's probably some causal variants that drive phenotypic variation in your complex traits or diseases, but they don't tell you how they do it. They just tell you that there could exist a SNP in the region that drives phenotypic variation. Um, and so nowadays, 
uh, I mean, GWAS, you know, finding this set of all genetic variants associated with a complex trait or disease is, you know, still obviously a big problem for a lot of traits and diseases. But one of the bigger problems that people now try to tackle in the field are basically the question of mechanism of action. So how do genetic, how do these genetic variants uh, within these kind of regions, um, how do they work? And so how people do that is by basically doing GWAS studies where you swap out the phenotype. So instead of the phenotype being something like, you know, disease incidence at the organism level, uh, you would actually test for association between genetic variation and molecular phenotypes. So you could use, uh, by using, by performing assays like RNA sequencing for gene expression or, uh, you know, chip seek for histone modifications, or even uh, things like yeast 2 hybrid, so on to get interactions, or regulatory networks for interactions. Um, you can actually find associations between genetics and a lot of the different types of assays that we've talked about in this class. So pretty much almost every functional assay that we talked about in this class, you could measure genetic associations with it, and people have done it. And so, uh, we talked about human genetics in this lecture, mainly just to get you guys used to the idea that association studies are not just for kind of organism level phenotypes like disease, they're also for molecular phenotypes as well. So the final point that I want to touch on is that of missing heritability. So the idea here is that uh, if you want to study what the impact of genetics overall is on phenotypic variability uh, for complex traits and diseases. One way you can do this is by performing a twin study, right? And so by looking at genetically identical or nearly identical individuals and by studying what their discordance is in terms of, for example, disease incidence or differences in complex traits, you can guess pretty good accuracy what the proportion of variance of a trait is that can be explained by genotype. And so informally, that's what people refer to as heritability, is the proportion of variance of a trait that is due to genetics. Um, and so there's specific kinds of heritability, like broad versus narrow sense. But intuitively, you're just asking what proportion of the variance of a trait is due to genetics. And so intuitively, if you recall back at, earlier in the lecture, I talked about the goodness of fit of a line, right? And I said for a single SNP, um, you can fit a line to the you know genotype versus phenotype scatter plot, and you can measure, in some sense, the error of that line of fit, where large error corresponds to big scatter at the blue points around the black line, and small error basically leads to small scatter of the blue points around the black line. And so intuitively from that diagram, you can get the sense that if the genotype of an individual at that particular position is a strong predictor of the phenotypic variation, then the scatter is going to be small, right? And so similarly, the idea here is that for trait, if, if you know that a trait based on twin studies is very heritable. That means that when you're essentially predicting the phenotype of an individual based on genotypes, kind of in, you know, in an analogous way to our line fitting procedure, that means that you should be able to predict someone's disease instance, for instance, fairly well with genotype and therefore there should be small amounts of scatter of the blue points around the black line. Right, and so another way of saying that is that if you have an estimate of the heritability of a trait uh, based on twin studies, then that should tell you about what the error is of your line of fit in some sense. So I'm, I'm really abusing the analogy to the line of fit here, but I think the intuition is, is, is right here. And so basically the more heritable a trait is, then the tighter you should see the points scatter around the black line. Right, the black line should be a better and better fit of the of the blue points essentially. And so missing heritability refers to the fact that for most complex traits, 
the scatter we see around the black line is greater than what we'd expect based on the twin studies. And so the twin study says that genotype should be able to accurately predict phenotype very well, but based on our line fitting procedures, it doesn't predict very well at all. And so that difference between what we expect, uh, what kind of goodness of fit we expect based on twin studies, which I'm referring to as E-twins, when that is much smaller than the error that we actually observe based on genetics, so that's E-observe, then that's that's when we say there's missing heritability because we know that we should be able to explain phenotype better based on genetics, but we're currently not able to. And so there's you know, still long-standing arguments in the field of human genetics as to why, he, why missing heritability exists. Is it a function of the fact that our uh, GWAS-based studies are just poorly powered? Do we just not have enough people? Or is our model of association testing and phenotype prediction just bad? Like, are these linear models just poor explainers of phenotypic variation? And do we just need better models that, for, for example, account for more epistasis or things like this? And so, yeah, so some final thoughts I'll leave you with are that, you know, number one is missing heritability, a problem of power. Do we need more people in our studies or do we just need better models? Um, Another point I really want to drive home is that, again, most of the variants associated with complex traits and diseases in humans are non-coding regions of the genome that are, that are, you know, unannotated for the most part. And so one of the huge open questions in human genetics is, you know, what are they doing? And so the answer is, you know, is probably going to be found in large part by using a lot of the assays that we talked about in the class from epigenomes, transcriptomes, nuclear organization to help find map variants and, and answer the question, what does each of these potential variants actually do at the molecular level?